Today, we're all just a cell phone selfie away from worldwide exposure. We live in a culture that worships fame and is addicted to instant celebrity. Of course, it wasn't always this way. The fever began in mid-19th century America with the emergence of the first showbiz star to go truly global. General Tom Thumb. He was just 25 inches tall. He sang, he danced, he acted. Over the course of his life, he was seen by over 50 million people. One admirer was President Abraham Lincoln, no less. He was just as big here in Britain. Queen Victoria adored him, and he often popped into Buckingham Palace for tea. His real name was Charles Stratton. Aged just four, he was thrust on stage by the legendary showman P.T. Barnum. Barnum created Tom Thumb, manipulating the press, staging a celebrity wedding, and even producing a fake baby. The intelligentsia were horrified. One rival artist was even driven to suicide. Charles Stratton became famous and rich, but he had no choice in his career, which meant being stared at by millions of people who regarded him as a freak. Was this a great success story, or was it exploitation? And don't think this is just a Victorian fascination. Throughout the 20th century, little people continued to get big laughs on stage and screen. I'm here to entertain you with my little pansies. While today, we remain fascinated by performers with unusual bodies. I've been in entertainment all my life, but for me, Tom Thumb is the best showbiz story of them all. I want to find out how he achieved such dazzling fame and at what cost. So, roll up, roll up for the extraordinary story of the real Tom Thumb. In 1842, a showbiz hustler was on his way to New York when the Hudson River froze over. He was forced to spend the night here in Bridgeport, where his brother ran a small hotel. His name was P.T. Barnum, and in time, he would be famous from Chicago to Calcutta. Mr. Entertainment, the world's greatest showman. But in 1842, he was less renowned. He was the purveyor of hair tonic for men, exhibits in glass cases, and freak shows. Phineas Barnum was both respectable and a con man. He'd seen that the public craved freaks of nature, and he was happy to give nature a little helping hand. His hoaxes over the previous decade included a cat dyed purple and a 161-year-old woman but his biggest draw was the Fiji mermaid. His adverts promised the public a genuine nymph of the South Pacific. The reality was a little different. Ah, here she is, the Fiji mermaid. <laughs> Kathy, 
Do you mean to tell me that Barnum got people to pay to look at this creature? Barnum got people to pay to look at this creature, but it was calculated. He had, there were steps that he knew he had to prepare the public's mind, and Barnum took months to calculate an advertisement promotion where he had friends in Alabama and Washington write letters, so completely far apart in the country, to New York newspapers to get the public's interest up. To really sort people. of viral marketing, oh, we would call it absolutely. today. Absolutely, in 1842. They were expecting all of the promotions showed beautiful mermaids, something that you would think of in your imagination, and then when people actually got a glimpse of it. They were horrified. Do we know what the, she's made of? We do, actually. Well, this is a reproduction, but the original was really the, the body of an orangutan or a monkey, and then the, the tail and the fins and the scales of a fish. The fishy mermaid netted Barnum a hefty fortune. How to follow that? Stranded in his Bridgeport hotel that freezing winter of 1842, Barnum unexpectedly had time to do a bit of talent scouting. He'd heard the whispers about an extraordinary local boy, and that night his brother brought the parents to the hotel with the boy. Meet Charles Stratton, four years old and exactly 25 inches high, but with a big future. Charles's parents, Sherwood and Cynthia Stratton, were fully grown, but poor. Doctors couldn't explain why their son was so small. Barnum offered them a few dollars and signed the boy on the spot. The kid might grow, but his mum and dad had said he hadn't put on an inch since he was five months old. And if he didn't grow, he'd be the kind of freak that people would queue round the block to see. Barnum could smell the money. In 1842, that money was in New York. Not the glamorous destination of today, but a raw, rough, crime-ridden boom town. A third of a million New Yorkers thronged the streets, and they were hungry for entertainment. Barnum's plan was to exhibit Charles at his flagship attraction, the American Museum. Thank you. It stood at the south end of Broadway. Today, a rather grim office block. But back then, one of the most exciting addresses in the city. It wasn't a museum as we know them, more like an early Disneyland. Inside its heaving rooms, you could find exotic animals, human automata, a working model of Niagara Falls, and an aquarium. All packaged by a savvy Barnum as respectable family fun. This was a great day out for the citizen who paid 25 cents and expected to be enthralled. You might be shocked, but you'd learn something at the same time. Education, information, titillation. I suppose it's a kind of Victorian internet run by a great showman who was interested in anything legal that would sell.
but the museum's most intriguing attraction was the Hall of Living Curiosities. Here, the public could brush shoulders with giants, dwarves, and all manner of weirdly shaped persons. It was the world's first mass appeal, fully commercialized freak show, and the four-year-old boy's new home. At one extreme were sort of the, the very exotic freaks, wild people who were described as cannibals or savages or missing links who were somewhere between human and animal. And at the far other extreme of the spectrum were the respectable freaks. And I would certainly put Charles Stratton in that category. These were individuals who had very, very unusual bodies. And so part of what was fascinating about them was that there they were um, decked out in suits and they had good manners and they could speak well. And, and so there was that jarring contradiction between respectability and then the highly unusual nature of the body. It sounds to me like a frightening place for a child. However, in this dark place, he positively shone. Shortly after putting little Charles in the Hall of Curiosities, Barnum made an amazing discovery. The kid was wasted in the freak show. He was a natural born performer and only incidentally a freak. It would have been a light bulb moment if they'd been invented. At the heart of the American Museum was a vast theater. Barnum had one of his crazy ideas. Could his tiny star command this massive space? Scenting more profits, he followed his instincts. In December 1842, his new act stepped out onto the stage. Mr. P.T. Barnum is proud to announce he has imported from London to add to his collection of the most extraordinary curiosities from all over the world, the rarest, the tiniest, the most diminutive dwarf imaginable. But I want you to imagine this is his very, very first time on a stage. He looks out at the auditorium, much bigger than this, 3,000 seats, every one of them filled. Put yourself in his shoes for a moment, which incidentally were only three inches long. You're four years old. You're this small. You've only just come to the city. The biggest crowd you've ever seen is probably a few farmers at the cattle market. And your manager, whatever that means, a few weeks ago reckoned you were pretty bashful. What are you feeling like at this moment? Mr. Barnum taught you to pose like a statue out there in the exhibition hall alongside the two-headed snakes in the bottle. But in here, he wants you to play characters from history. He wants you to dance little dances. He wants you to sing Yankee Doodle Dandy. And now there are two-handed skits, like this one. I say, what dress is this? It's my Oxonian dress. It is the dress presented by the students at Oxford. What do you represent now? A fellow. I understand. A fellow at Oxford. No, a little fellow. Well, not exactly Shakespeare. But what was important was that Charles Stratton not only understood the words, but had a gift for comic timing. The Barnum spin had begun, and it started with a change of identity. Mr. 
The name Tom Thumb came from an old English fairy tale where little Tom fought great battles mounted on a mouse. Barnum's choice of name was brilliant branding. The press took the bait. General Tom Thumb Jr., the dwarf, exhibiting at the American Museum, is by far the most wonderful specimen of a man that ever astonished the world. The idea of a young gentleman, 11 years old, weighing less than an infant at six months is truly wonderful. He is lively, talkative, well-proportioned, and withal quite a comical chap. He builds him up in the press. He, he, he says he's from England uh, because someone from England would be exotic. Someone from Bridgeport wasn't really that exotic for the people in New York. He gave him the title of general, which is a sort of classic celebrity status enhancement, right? You know? Really? Yeah, you know, Prince or Madonna or Elvis the King. Duke you know, Ellington. Duke Count Ellington. Basie. That's right. But for him, it was also funny because he was so small. Now, it, there must have been a concern in Barnum's mind that the public might say, well, he's, he's only five. What do you, how big do you expect him to be? Right, well, he, he, he tricked them by saying that he was seven years older than he really was. Oh, he said he was 12, He yes. was 11 and then later 12 um, to make him seem even smaller. Even more incredible. That's right, that's right. And um, the, the surprising thing to me about that was that all these people are meeting him, the mayor of New York, and nobody questions the age. And so that means he must have been a really intelligent child. General Tom Thumb's act was a mixed bill. He'd pose in a white body stocking impersonating classical statues. He'd banter with straight men in little skits. And he'd bring the house down by dancing a miniature hornpipe. Audiences went wild. Barnum had understood his public. Tom Thumb combined two magic ingredients, fascination with the strange and cheap laughs. The boy was now set to work, regardless of his age, or what we'd call his disability. It sounds like a tale of Dickensian exploitation. Yet I grew up in a world that wasn't that different. The Morton Fraser Harmonica Gang. In comedy then, Small was still beautiful. <laughs> well, I learned as a kid going to the Variety Theatre that Small was funny. There were so many small people on the variety stage making thousands and thousands of people laugh. I can think of Jimmy Clitheroe, obviously, uh, and his predecessor, Wee Georgie Wood. Arthur Askey was no giant. Uh, and then there were the speciality acts, uh, Morton Fraser and his harmonica gang, Johnny Paleo. They all used very, very tiny people uh, to get cheap laughs. Screams and gales of laughter guaranteed every time you saw them. But what is this like for the performer? How does it feel to make your size your selling point? Hi, David. Hey, how are you? How you doing? Good, good, good. Good to see you. <laughs> Grab a chair. David Funes is an entertainer whose career began in a similar way to that of Charles Stratton. What was your first job? I worked as Cupid. I was as Cupid? Yeah, I dressed up as Cupid. In what? And <laughs> I was in a diaper, and the funny thing is, is in a that diaper. yes. <laughs> so I just invented a, a costume out of the blue. I had toilet paper wrapped around me as a banner. And, and was it a play or was it a musical or? No, it was um, what you call a club. Yeah, 
a club. Yeah. And I just basically danced like as a go-go boy type thing. But when they said they, when you got the job and they said they wanted you to play Cupid and wear a diaper, a nappy, did you at any time feel you were being exploited? Or yes. You did? All the time. But like, you just thought of the money? And since the beginning of the gig, since till the end of the gig, I would feel like I was being exploited all day. <laughs> and I was thinking to myself, what am I doing? Like, do I want to do this? Do, what is going to come out of this? What is the money going to come out? Uh, what are people's reaction? What are my parents' reaction going to be? But I just saw this as, you know what? I'm going to do it. I'm going to become better at what I do. So there was a moment where you actually came to terms with it and said, actually, it's a job? Yes. But are you still doing the diaper act, or are you, uh, you <laughs> nah. moved on from that? I moved on from the diaper act. What was the next job? Uh, the next job was St. Patrick's Day. St. Patrick's Day? Yes, doing as what? a little leprechaun. <laughs> As a leprechaun. Yeah, that's our favorite time of the year. Argentinian <laughs> leprechaun, yes. <laughs> what do you feel about being typecast in those sorts of roles? You know, the phone rings and... You know, okay. Um, yeah, nice. and that's how it, it is. Um, I'm just like, okay, you know what? It's time to do this and everything like that. But then when I get on the stage, it's such yeah. a different feeling. It's such a euphoric feeling. Really? That I, yeah, I feel very excited like I feel like there is such an energy a buzz. That's you get a ready. buzz from yes. an audience yes I actually feed off the audience uh -huh. if you're gonna have a negative outlook and how do you see it you're never gonna be able to succeed in this business so I always keep it positive <laughs> if David had been scared at first the four-year-old Charles's debut must have been terrifying <laughs> But I was also beginning to understand how success for a little person on stage could start to be addictive. That success was coming very quickly for Charles Stratton. For much of his fifth year, he was on the road, or rather, on the railroad. Charles was born as the steam age took off. And the new trains meant his fame could be spread in ways impossible just a few years ago. For the next year, Charles toured to Boston and around New England, his fame steadily growing. His eyes forever on his box office, Barnum New Image was everything. And this began with Charles's wardrobe. a very early piece that belonged to Charles Stratton and was actually given to the museum by P.T. Barnum. Um, it's a little um, <gasps> jacket. Oh my. A little tailcoat here. Very tiny as you can see. He was about 25 inches tall when he would have worn this. It wasn't just the size that mattered. Barnum made sure Charles's clothes were made of the most exquisite materials. This is all bespoke, isn't it? Every one of these is handmade of course. for oh, him. Gosh. Aren't they beautiful? Barnum so cleverly used clothing to boost Charles's age and his social standing. He became not just a man, but a gentleman. Are two hats in here. Right. Oh my goodness. They're tiny. Yes. They're like thimbles. Now th this pair we think are really the, the most special. I mean it's just exquisite. Goodness. Me. Stand up. I mean these are beautiful. He could afford the best and did. And, and these are the best. This is He's top of the range. Barnum had tailored the perfect image for Charles, but how could his star be seen beyond the railroad tracks? 
Luckily, mid-19th century America was the right place at the right time. Previously, all original publicity images had to be created by an artist by hand. Yet all this was to change. Photography arrived in 1839, making it one year younger than Charles. Now everyone could see his incredible dimensions for real. Ever ready to exploit any means to boost Charles's fame, Barnum rushed the boy into the studio. That goes in there. Yeah, so you I'm being photographed the Victorian way. Let the light, in. light in, and then go, it's whoosh. One thousand elephants, two thousand elephants, three thousand elephants. So the equivalent of a shutter today is when you just take the lens cap off. That's correct, right? and you're going to be typically. In this light, probably three minutes exposure. Right. That's how long. Right. And you want me to go and pose? If you wouldn't mind. Not difficult for me. Um, I brought my top hat with me. OK, that's fortunate. Lovely. Photography accelerated Charles's fame, and the arrival of its latest product brought him into the family home. So we go. 1,000 elephants, 2,000 elephants, 3,000 Part calling card, part publicity shot, part football sticker. The carte de visite enabled his fans to buy a souvenir Tom Thumb to keep. The scale of the carte de visite was absolutely phenomenal. In Queen Victoria, for example, there were between about three and four million carts of her produced between 1860 and 1862. So she was incredibly popular, and those were ending up in people's family albums, in individuals' houses, and they were collecting the whole of the royal family, and politicians and artists and clergymen, and all these people to put in their own albums. Was there a roaring trade in, in carte de visite of, of the abnormal, the, the curiosities, as Barnum used to call them. You find pictures of people like Stratton, um, people with medical, particular medical conditions, and people like Chang, the, the giant, who was collected, photographed in the UK and on tour when he was exhibited. And for a lot of people then, they were seeing these types of people in the exhibitions for the first time, so they would take them back and show them to their friends. And Barnum, I think, understood this because they would then come back to the exhibition and pay an entrance fee to go and see them in person. So the pictures were his best marketing tool. Right, well, good news. Oh, did I keep still? <laughs> Perfectly. Oh, wow. That's very distinguished. 150 yeah. years late, but... By royal appointment, portrait from life. Oh, I love that. My own carte de visite. Photographs made Charles visible and railroads made him widely accessible. By the time he was six, he had toured the eastern cities for a year and had added new routines. Like dragging up as a little girl called Our Mary Ann. The people couldn't get enough of him. One wag even wrote a poem in praise. The streets were unpeopled, all business was dumb, absorbed in the interest of General Tom Thumb. Barnum was making a fortune with Charles in the USA, but he was a risk taker. Across the Atlantic lay Europe, the cradle of civilization and the home of vaster audiences. Barnum sent it even more money, but he'd have to start from scratch. On January the 19th, 1844, Charles, his parents and Barnum boarded the steamship, the SS Yorkshire, and set sail for England. It was a brave time to make the trip. 
Just 30 years earlier, the two nations had been at war. And the Brits had left the White House a burnt out shell. To many Victorian Britons, Americans were just a bunch of uncouth hicks. After three weeks at sea, Charles Barnum and their entourage landed. With little idea of what was in store, they headed for the biggest city on earth. London. A population of nearly two million made the city over four times bigger than New York. Crammed with theatres, opera houses, flea pits and exhibition halls, this was a town ravenous for the latest sensation. And what they liked most were the freakish and the strange. There's a sense that this is a, a, a form of entertainment that is booming. Um, the Punch magazine announced that the country has been gripped by deformitomania. <laughs> so there's a well-developed public appetite for this kind of entertainment. And circuits are forming, you know, acts are travelling the country. What sort of exhibits would there be? I mean, were they people with genuine deformities or were there, you know, faked bearded ladies and scams? There were. I mean, it's a very mixed economy, this. But if, for instance, you'd gone to see a pig-faced lady, well, you might be seeing a bear chained to a chair, put in a crinoline and shaved strategically <laughs> to look more human-like. <laughs> so there are all kinds of game. But it was uh, a money-making enterprise, and the public was fascinated. The public was fascinated. The public had an insatiable curiosity for human oddity. Where does that come from, do you think? Is that a Victorian thing, or is it, has it always been there? There's an immense history to this. I mean, if you'd have gone to, to Bartholomew Fair, if you'd been around in the Middle Ages, uh, there would have been entertainment like this. What happens in uh, the 19th century is that it becomes rather more organised. Commercialised? Absolutely, yes, yeah. I mean, this is business. This is business in which contracts are issued, in which arrangements are made. <laughs> The Princess Theatre once stood here on Oxford Street. On the 20th of February, 1844, and just turned six, the General first stepped out onto the London stage. That night, the bill was offering vaudeville, farce and Italian diversions. Tom Thumb was squeezed in between acts two and three of a cut-down version of Donizetti's opera, Don Pasquale. The press was not kind. The Illustrated London News called Tom Thumb a little monster who provided melancholy proof of the low state the legitimate drama has been reduced to. Well, I think it would be fair to say it wasn't a roaring success. Um, it's not the right kind of venue for him because people don't listen hard enough. People don't pay attention properly. Yeah. You didn't have to behave yourself in this sort of environment. Barnum had hoped to set the West End alight, but the great premiere had turned into a damp squib. This was a pivotal moment for Barnum. As he stood in the wings and watched America's biggest star, his star, failing to wow the audience, he must have thought he'd left his magic touch somewhere in mid-Atlantic. He needed to come up with something, and quickly. And he had a genius idea. Barnum decided to market Charles to the upper classes.
the Yankee had instinctively grasped the aspirational nature of the British class system. He knew that aristocratic endorsement would quickly sway the mass market. The first thing he needed was to invite the right callers to the right address. So he splashed out on the rental of number 13 Grafton Street, Mayfair. Barnum set about pursuing anyone and everyone in the upper echelons and issuing invitations. And they were intrigued. The Dukes of Buckingham, Bedford and Devonshire came by. Sir Robert and Lady Peel popped in. And when he saw Charles give him an impersonation of Napoleon at a private audience, my dear, they couldn't get rid of the Duke of Wellington. Knight led to Lord, Lord led to Duke, further on up the ladder, until, as Barnum had hoped, they reached the summit. On the 9th of March, a soldier of the lifeguards arrived at Grafton Street to invite Charles and Barnum to an audience with Her Majesty Queen Victoria. This was the big gamble. It was make or break. Success could make them both rich for life. Failure, the end of Barnum's global ambitions. Once again, the great showman put all his chips on a single spin of the wheel. Resplendent in their new hand-tailored court suits, on March the 23rd, 1844, Barnum and the six-year-old Charles arrived at Buckingham Palace to meet the most powerful woman in the world. Picture the scene. The Queen sits at one end of a very long stateroom. With her is Prince Albert, uh, some ladies-in-waiting and assorted courtiers. Charles and Barnum make their entrance, beautifully dressed in their brand new black velvet court attire. The Queen is dressed simply in black. There are flunkies everywhere, dressed in black, not unlike a funeral. Anyway, Charles marches towards the Queen and opens with, Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Not exactly protocol, but the Yanks have made their entrance. Charles launched into his routine, singing cheeky songs and rattling off a few impressions. It was risky stuff. The court was officially in mourning for Prince Albert's father. But no one kicked them out, and after a quick finale, they prepared to depart. Barnum has been well briefed on the royal protocol. Never turn your back on the monarch. So he starts to reverse out bowing as he goes. Charles tries to keep up with Barnum, but his little legs won't let him. So he turns and runs and stops and bows. And he turns and runs and stops and bows. All this sets off a royal spaniel. The dog is the same height as Charles. It leaps forward and starts barking and barking. Spontaneously, and this is genius. Charles pulls out his tiny ceremonial sword and starts pretending to fence with Fido. The room erupts into hysterical laughter. The Queen is amused, and they get invited back. It was a triumph. Two more visits to the palace soon followed. There's a rather affecting sort of intimacy about this relationship. Um, the royal children are introduced to him. There's a lot of comparison of heights. So he's brought within really the very core of that family circle. They're like some stranger, elevated, odd, distorted version of the ordinary Victorian middle class family. Victoria and Charles may seem like an odd pairing, 
but she was only doing what many rulers had done before. For centuries, dwarves had been royal entertainers. Just look, for example, at Velázquez's paintings of the court dwarves of Philip IV of Spain. I wonder if there wasn't a certain kind of identification between freaks and royalty. On the one hand, royalty have the world at their fingertips. Everything is available to them. At the same time, there must be a certain sense of loneliness and isolation. It's an incredibly rarefied position to find oneself in. And there's no anonymity, no possibility of simply mingling with the public at large. And so, so I wonder if there wasn't a, a kind of recognition between um, these, these very elite royals and um, the freaks who came to see them in a sense that in, in some way they, they occupied a similar position socially. Whatever the Queen's motivation, Barnum had worked his magic again. After Victoria, Anyone who was anyone had to see Tom Thumb. In London, he was the talk of the town. Here at the Lyceum Theatre, it was standing room only. Charles Dickens dragged a few of his friends here to see him hiding in a daisy and popping out of a nut in a play entitled Hop O' My Thumb. Riding on the wave of Queen Victoria's approval, Barnum took Charles on a European tour, playing Belgium, Spain and France. Charles was developing as a performer. Up to now, he was doing songs and sketches and impressions. But then two French dramatists wrote a play specially for him, which he learned in French. And he was very good at it. Barnum described him smashing audiences, killing them. So now our lad was doing his whole act plus two plays in French every single day. Well, he was eight years old. After his shows, the boy in adult clothing, lit by limelight, met his public. It was noticeable that women were always first in line. Women had very interesting reactions to him. It, he was very cute kid, um, but we think of him as a kid, but they thought of him as much older because remember, Barnum is inflating his age. Uh, there were many women who looked at him with a sort of motherly affection, but there were others who took a more, uh, you know, erotic interest in him, and it became quite inappropriate at times. Um, in what way? Well, when they're selling souvenirs after the show, he would stand there and give kisses, or what he called his receipts, to uh, anyone who bought a souvenir. And so women would apparently line up around the block to get these kisses from him. You know, they'd buy a photograph and then they'd get a kiss. They'd buy a book of Barnum's and they'd get a kiss. Um, and some of them would just peck him on the cheek, but some of them would not. So it became a little bit of an issue. And, and there were reports from men who are very upset that their wives and daughters are, you know, spending all their money <laughs> on getting kisses from, from Charles. Wow. By 1846, Barnum had decided it was once again time to move back to America. He posted bills for a series of farewell shows at London's prestigious Egyptian Hall. It was here that Tom Thumb would finally collide head-on with the Victorian cultural establishment, who had reason to see themselves as the defenders of civilization itself, because another very different attraction had booked into the famous venue at the very same time. 